Good evening, everyone. Dear Professor Friedman, dear Chairman of Swiss National Bank, dear Thomas, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you here once more to the Audi Max of ETH Zurich. With the start of the semester, a couple of days ago, our campus is once again filled with the vibrant life of our students. And we are all grateful that we can meet in person and benefit from opportunities for intellectual exchanges like tonight. I'm very much looking forward to Ben Friedman's lecture on the influence of religious thinking on capitalist thinking, which perhaps no one shaped as much as Adam Smith with his bestseller, The Wealth of Nations. Religion and Rise of Capitalism is, of course, an auspicious title for a lecture that immediately raises many questions. Is religion meant in a comprehensive sense, or is it about a particular manifestation of religious belief, as Max Weber wrote in his famous treatise on the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism at the beginning of the 20th century? How does religion make itself felt concretely in Adam's, Adam Smith's conception of the invisible hand in a world of self-interest and competition? And what impact, so now it's the physicist speaking, uh, Ben, what impact did Isaac Newton's revolutionary ideas have on Adam Smith and his contemporaries? You see, Questions upon questions popped up my mind. As an economist, our speaker ventures out of the ivory tower of his own discipline and scores the history of ideas for the religious and philosophical underpinnings in economic thinking. I'm convinced, looking beyond one's own nose and taking an interest in others' disciplines, is a necessary, is necessary in science today. At ETH, we try to live up to this principle by fostering interdisciplinarity and a holistic thinking in the education of our engineers and natural scientists. From the US Canadian economist John Gen Kenneth Galbraith comes the quote, economic ideas are always an intimately a product of their time and place. They cannot be seen apart from the world they interpret. This applies not only to economic ideas, but also to attitudes towards science and technological progress. The prevailing optimism of the 1960s and the belief in feasibility have now given way to a poignant fear of the future in view of war, global warming, the worldwide health crisis we all have just experienced, this is not surprising. The development of highly effective vaccines in record time has been a success story for scientists, for many of us. But there has also been fierce opposition to mandatory vaccination in our countries, in Switzerland. I can mention also the Swiss COVID app that was launched by ETH and EPFL as the first worldwide fantastic technological uh, development taken over by Google, by Apple, and um, that has little success in Switzerland, I must say. <laughs> so, um, the scientist on the National COVID tax Task Force, so there was a national task force uh, helping our government, and 10 professors from ETH were part of this task force, we were leading the task force, suddenly found themselves in the middle of a debate about personal freedom versus public health, about government intervention versus economic freedom. For me, therefore, one lesson from the pandemic is that we must intensify the dialogue with society. It's not enough to intensify it when we are in the crisis. We will continue to have different opinions in the future, 
We will weight political decisions differently on the basis of our value systems, but we, as society, must take the conversation between politics, science, and all relevant social groups. We have to take this an ongoing task and thus create trust so that we can master the next crisis with less friction, and there will be more crises. Ladies and gentlemen, an event like the one tonight is for me an outstanding example of such a dialogue with society. And I'm glad that we can provide the stage for such a high-profile series of lectures organized by the Swiss National Bank. So great thank from my side. And now I would like to hand over to J Thomas Jordan, who will introduce our guest speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the sixth Karl Brunner Distinguished Lecture. The Swiss National Bank established this annual lecture series in honor of the Swiss economist Karl Brunner, one of the leading monetary economists of the last century. Our aim with these lectures is to reach a broad audience and contribute to the public debate on issues related to central banking and economics more broadly. This year's Karl Brunner Distinguished Lecture is special for several reasons. After a three-year break by the pandemic, the lecture finally returns to the ETH Zurich. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. I also want to thank Joel Mezzo, the president of the ETH Zurich, for making these fantastic premises available to us yet again. Above all, this year's event is special because of the person giving the lecture. Benjamin Friedman is the William Joseph Meyer Professor of Political Economy at Harvard University. He's one of the world's foremost thinkers on monetary policy and an outstanding public intellectual. In addition, he's among the few still active economists who knew Karl Brunner well. Even though they did no, not always agree on economic matters, the two maintained a close personal relationship characterized by mutual respect. Now, the highest respect, coupled with a fair dose of nervousness, is also what I felt while sitting in the waiting room outside Ben's office, having just arrived at Harvard as a young postdoc. I will never forget the moment when I first entered Ben's office with its traditional furniture and its walls packed with majestic books staring down at me. I could truly feel the vast amount of knowledge present in that room. Fortunately, Ben welcomed me warmly and my anxiety quickly dissipated. Indeed, I could not have hoped for a better mentor for my stay at Harvard. I have learned a great deal from Ben, not only as an economist, but also as a person. Now, Ben is an unusual scholar in many respects. His research is extraordinarily broad and deep, as demonstrated by the topic of today's lecture, namely the influence of religious thinking on economic thinking. Some of you may ask what this has to do with the Swiss National Bank. Now, well, people's faith in the currency is essential, an essential precondition for successful monetary policy, organizing public lectures on religion may seem a little far-fetched. However, allow me to reassure you that Ben has also published over 150 academic articles on monetary policy, macroeconomics, and financial markets. He's therefore a most logical candidate to give the Karl Brunner Distinguished Lecture, even on a topic that may seem unusual at first sight. Born in Louisville, Kentucky, Benjamin Friedman went to Harvard University 
with the intention to st of studying law, but soon realized that economics suited him better. He pursued his studies at Harvard and at Cambridge University in England. Early in his career, Ben worked for various entities of the Federal Reserve System and at Morgan Stanley. In 1972, at the age of 25, he was appointed assistant professor of economics at Harvard University. Ben has remained a loyal faculty member at Harvard for five decades, including a three-year spell as the chairman of the economics department. And Ben recently celebrated 50 years as a professor at Harvard. Many of his former students traveled from all around the world to attend the occasion. The interaction with his students has been of utmost importance to Ben, and he would remain in contact with them for decades following their graduation. A number of these former students today occupy leading positions in academia, central banking, and government. This shows that Ben has been not only an outstanding researcher, but also an influential, influential teacher of economics. Now, spending 50 years in the same place is not as unusual as one might think, at least not when we consider some of the great Enlightenment thinkers Ben so deeply admires. Take Immanuel Kant, who developed his philosophy without ever leaving his hometown of Königsberg. According to the legend, Kant became such an integral part of the city that people would set their watch by the time he left his house for his afternoon walk. Now, whether Ben's daily routines have the same effect on the people in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we do not know. What we do know is that, fortunately for us, Ben is not quite as averse to traveling as Kant was. Most importantly, he lets his mind travel, exploring not only the world of economics, but many other disciplines as well. But let me say a few more words about Ben's contributions to monetary economics. His research covers all aspects of monetary policy. He spans everything, it spans everything from the technical details of how central banks steer short-term interest rates in money markets to fundamental questions about the mandate lawmakers should give to central banks. Doing justice to this vast body of work in a few sentences is impossible. I will therefore limit myself to a few key elements. Characteristic of Ben's work is the critical analysis of ideas that have become fashionable in the profession. In the 1970s and 80s, when monetary targeting was in its heyday, Ben argued that central banks were too focused on the money supply and did not pay enough attention to other variables. In a number of influential papers, he showed that the amount of outstanding credit in the economy may be a useful predictor of future output and prices. Ben concluded that credit should play an important role in central banks' decision-making. The extent to which central banks should pay attention to credit, to credit aggregates remains, remains a hotly debated, hotly debated question to this day. Now, Ben was among the first to highlight their potential significance for monetary policy. Another example of Ben's tendency to go against the mainstream is his critique of the use of rational expectations in macroeconomic models. When the rational expectations revolution transformed the field of macroeconomics in the late 1970s, Ben remained skeptical. He criticized the assumption that economic agents from their expect, formed their expectations based on a perfect understanding of how the economy works. These models did not address the question of how economic agents derived this knowledge in the first place. More recently, the literature has begun to develop models with forward-looking agents 
that have a limited understanding of how the economy works. This research program is very much in the spirit of Ben's early criticism. A final example of Ben's willingness to challenge the accepted wisdom of the day is his reservation about inflation targeting. When one central bank after another started to adopt inflation targeting in the 1990s, Ben became one of the most prominent critics of this new monetary policy strategy. His concern was that inflation targeting would lead central banks to focus single-mindedly on price stability. In doing so, Ben feared they may lose sight of their ultimate goal of promoting economic well-being more broadly. Ben is wi widely recognized as one of the world's leading macroeconomists. However, his research interests go far beyond that. Ben is a polymath, something that has become rare in modern academia. His writings cross academic boundaries between economics, philosophy, history, and religion. An excellent example of Ben's interdisciplinary work is his book, The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth, published in 2005. Economists have written countless papers on how to increase growth. But very few have addressed the question of why growth is desirable in the first place, in particular in societies that are already rich. Ben's book fills this gap. It argues that economic growth improves the moral character of society. People tend to be more generous and tolerant towards each other when the economy grows. Economic stagnation, on the other hand, is associated with repression and bigotry. Ben's latest book, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, was published last year. It describes how religion has shaped economic thinking since the beginning of our discipline. The early economic thinkers of the European Enlightenment, such as Adam Smith, were not committed to religion. Ben argues, however, that their worldview was profoundly influenced by developments in religions, religious thinking. There is, therefore, a close connection between religion and the beginning of modern capitalism. With this, I would like to conclude my remarks, since you are, since you are surely eager to learn more about this fascinating topic from Ben himself. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Benjamin Friedman with a big round of applause. Thank you, Thomas, for that extremely generous introduction, and President Mezzo, thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Thomas Jordan and to the other members of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank for inviting me to give this distinguished lecture in memory of my dear friend, Carl Brunner, and I'm grateful to President Mezzo for the uh, hospitality here at ETH. Uh, ETH is a place I have always heard of and have never until today have an opportunity to visit. In America, we think of this institution in connection with Einstein, and so I'm honored to give this lecture, and I'm honored to give it in this place. I want to say also that it's a particular honor to give a lecture hosted uh, by the Swiss National Bank with Thomas Jordan at the helm. Uh, as Thomas uh, indicated, he and I spent three years together uh, working on his uh, research. One of the great senses of fulfillment, I think, in a position like mine is to see so many of our students go on to positions of real responsibility uh, in the world and I think I've been as privileged as anyone in this regard, and I certainly look at Thomas Jordan as an exemplar of that kind of fulfillment that comes from seeing one's students move forward. Now, finally, I want to uh, 
uh, acknowledge my pleasure at giving the, not just a lecture for the Swiss National Bank, but the Carl Brunner uh, lecture. Uh, Carl was older than I. Uh, I met him when I was just starting out in the economics profession. Uh, he was a mentor to me. He was a personal friend uh, to me. Uh, I knew Carl well, as I mentioned uh, at, when I spoke at the uh, Swiss National Bank's event for Carl's centenary. One of my most painful memories is of the day that Carl called me on the telephone to break the news that his beloved Rosemary had died. I knew Rosemary very well, uh, too. And so getting to give a lecture in memory of Carl is very special to me. Now, most people in this room, I believe, probably think of Carl as the Carl Bruner of the Constance Seminar on Monetary Theory and Policy. And I'm looking around the room. I saw Kurt. I'm looking at George. Uh, I see a number of people who have been friends since the days of the Constance Seminar. Some of us here go back a long way. But there was also Carl Bruner of the Interlochen Seminar on Analysis and Ideology. Carl Bruner himself was not in any way a narrow intellectual or exclusively focused on uh, monetary theory and policy. Uh, Carl wrote papers with titles like Religion and the Public Order, like The Perception of Man and the Conception uh, of Society. In his famous interview published with John Kriegel, uh, Carl spoke fondly of having discussed theology with Frank Knight when he was at uh, Chicago, having discussed philosophy with Hans Reichenbach when he was at UCLA. And so I think it's important to understand that Carl, yes, of course, Carl was, as Thomas explained, one of the great, great uh, monetary economists of the 20th century. Uh, but Carl was more than that. Carl was an intellectual in the broadest possible way. And I'm eternally grateful for his influence on me when I was just starting out in our profession. Now, as uh, Thomas has mentioned, I'm going to be speaking on the basis of my most recent book called Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. And the central question that I take on in this book is one that I would hope would be of interest to any economist, and it is where our discipline comes from. Where did thinking in, that gave us modern Western economics evolve from? And why did it evolve when it did, not a hundred years earlier or a hundred years later? And of perhaps less interest, but interesting nonetheless, why did it evolve where it did, namely as part of the Scottish Enlightenment, rather than, for example, in Königsberg? Why didn't Kant come up with these ideas? Why didn't some of the thinkers uh, in Paris, like Canet, uh, come up uh, with the same ideas? Well, this is the central idea, the central question that I want to undertake in this uh, discussion. And to be even more specific, what I am going to take to be the crucial element, the foundational element of modern West, Western economics is what we call the first fundamental welfare theorem, namely the proposition that individuals, without any altruism required, but merely acting out of their own self-interest, can and under the right circumstances will end up making other people better off in addition to themselves. If we pause to think about this, this is a very fundamental insight, especially coming after centuries of intellectual concern and opposition to the notion of self-interested behavior in the economic sphere. Now, there are several key presumptions that, uh, two in particular, that are the standard answers to the questions that I posed. Uh, the first is that 
Uh, we look to Adam Smith and Smith's great work of 1776, The Wealth of Nations, uh, as what uh, Donald Winch called the fountainhead of all classical political economy. Uh, Donald was the uh, foremost uh, Acad um, Adam Smith scholar of our era. Donald is no longer with us, but uh, he clearly established the presumption, if it was not there already, that it was to Smith to whom we look. And the second idea is that because Smith and his colleagues like Hume and Ferguson and others were part of the Enlightenment, economics too was a product of the Enlightenment. And we think of the Enlightenment today as a movement away from notions of a God-centered universe toward what we in our modern vocabulary call uh, secular humanism. And uh, I point to uh, Nick Philipson. Uh, Nicholas Philipson incidentally wrote not the only uh, good biography of Adam Smith, but if you're interested in the work as opposed to the life, uh, Philipson wrote by far the best biography of uh, Smith. And what Nick said was that not just uh, the wealth of nations, but as he put it, uh, Smith's entire project for a modern science of man was built on the Enlightenment's quintessential attack on religion. And I don't think Nick believed that he was saying anything unusual. He didn't make a big thing of it. He thought he was merely uh, summarizing the intellectual terrain as he found it. Alas, Nick Philipson is also uh, no longer uh, with us. He died a year after Donald. Now, I'm going to accept the first of these uh, propositions. Uh, as I'll make clear, I believe it's true that the real intellectual origin of our discipline in its modern form was Smith's Wealth of Nations, but I'm going to reject the second one, and I'm going to argue instead that what enabled Smith and Hume and their other colleagues to create modern Western economics as we've had it ever since was in important part, the influence of what were then new and hotly contended uh, ways of thinking within the English-speaking Protestant world uh, of which they were a part. Still Protestant? Yes, but moving beyond the central uh, notions that were handed down from the uh, Reformation. Now, I want to pause to say that uh, Zurich is a particularly appropriate place in which to be having this conversation. Uh, as I hope people are well aware, there were three uh, early centers of the Reformation, uh, one in Wittenberg with uh, Luther, one here in Zurich with uh, Zwingli. Uh, Zwingli was a near contemporary of Luther, uh, the tension between them is very interesting. Zwingli was, to put it bluntly, desperate to have Luther's uh, approval for his uh, thinking, but Luther withheld it. And so the tension between the two men uh, created all sorts of interesting uh, aspects. And then third, Calvin in Geneva, but that was a generation later. And uh, Calvin did not arrive in Geneva until after uh, Zwingli had already died. Now, many of the early events that were crucial to the Reformation happened here in uh, Zurich. So, for example, this is what uh, Zurich looked like uh, when Zwingli was alive from an old etching. Uh, the Disputation of Zurich, as it was called, in 1523 was one of the very early uh, intellectual battles. Uh, the disputation here in Zurich uh, featured uh, Zwingli offering the Protestant side against uh, uh, Johannes Fabri. Uh, Fabri was at that time the vicar general of Constance, later became bishop of Vienna. Uh, 
And this was one of the first real battles between the Protestants and Catholics, intellectual battles. Uh, and it happened right here in Zurich. Uh, Zurich, of course, was also the scene of the publication of one of the first and most important translations of the Bible into the vernacular. The Zurich Bible was published in 1531, uh, printed by Froschauer. Uh, the translation team was led by Zwingli. It was not his personal translation the way the Luther Bible was Luther's, but it was done by a team effort of which Zing Zwingli was the leader. And the nice woodcuts that you're looking at uh, from the cover were done by the younger Hans Holbein. Now, not every aspect of the uh, Reformation, of course, and certain, not even every aspect of the Reformation here in Zurich uh, was at the high level of the disputation in 1523 or the publication uh, of the Bible. Things started to go in a rockier direction uh, fairly quickly. Uh, one of the first violent events was the storming of the Carthusian Monastery at Ittingen, happened in 1524, just the year after the disputation. In the same year uh, was the stripping of the uh, images uh, from uh, all of the churches in Zurich. Uh, this was ordered by the Zurich magistrates at the behest of uh, Zwingli, uh, I first learned about uh, stripping or damaging of images when I was a student at King's College, Cambridge. One of the things that I noticed is that all of the statues in the King's College, Cambridge chapel, the famous uh, uh, Henry VII uh, chapel, uh, all had the heads knocked off. And they've never been replaced. If you go see King's Chapel, you can see the smashed heads. This was not done this early because the Reformation hadn't come to England yet, but it was a product of the English Civil War in which the uh, Puritans went around with a hammer and just knocked off all of the heads. Uh, there were, of course, the usual uh, executions of uh, heretics, many by um, uh, burning, uh, but here in Zurich, the uh, penalty for being an Anabaptist was execution by drowning. Here's an old uh, woodcut of uh, the uh, execution by drowning of two Anabaptists in the year 1528. Uh, and of course, there was more violence uh, still. Uh, there was the first Kapel War in 1529, and then even more important for our purposes, the second Kapel War, that's what this is an etching of, in 1531. And what was especially important about the Second War is that that's where uh, Zwingli died. Uh, here is the uh, famous statue of Zwingli that's just down the hill from us uh, by the riverside. Uh, if you look, Zwingli is pictured carrying both a book, which is not surprising, but also carrying a sword. The sword is not metaphorical. Uh, Zwingli was a soldier, and he died in combat. He died in the Second Capel War fighting for the Protestant side. Now, with Zwingli dead, then the focus of the Reformation in Switzerland shifted to Geneva uh, with Calvin. And an interesting uh, experiment which uh, history did not let us run is what would have happened to the Reformation in Switzerland, and therefore in the English-speaking world as well, because what went to uh, England was from uh, Switzerland, uh, what would have happened if Zwingli had survived. But without Zwingli, the crucial thinking became Calvinist, not Zwinglian. Now, let me make very clear uh, at the outset that there's uh, something that I am not suggesting. I am not suggesting that the development of modern economics had anything to do with self-conscious attempt, uh, effort on the part of religiously committed individuals seeking to bring their uh, religious commitments to bear 
on their work in economics. Uh, this would be quite absurd to think for many of these individuals, especially Smith and Hume. Uh, remember that these, these people became international celebrities within their own lifetimes, and therefore we know a great deal about them uh, biographically. Uh, it would be absurd to think of uh, Hume, for example, as a religiously committed individual. Uh, Hume was a notorious skeptic. Some think he was an atheist. Uh, his contemporaries, many did. Uh, I don't uh, read him that way. Uh, but uh, he would uh, repeatedly refer to Church of England bishops as agents to superstition. Uh, and his great friend, William Robertson, who was the head of the Church of Scotland, repeatedly uh, referred to Hume as a heathen. Smith was more private about his uh, personal religious commitments. We know that his mother, to whom he was devoted, uh, was herself a devout Calvinist, but there's no evidence of any uh, particular religious uh, belief or commitment on Smith's part. Uh, he was, I think, what, uh, at least in America, we would think of as a deist of uh, the form of, say, Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin, many of the great figures uh, of that uh, era. Uh, Smith did have to appear at the presbytery in Glasgow and swear to the Westminster Confession as a condition for taking up his professorship at Glasgow. But at the same time, he requested an exemption from the requirement to begin every lecture with a prayer. Incidentally, his request was denied, and so Smith did have to begin every lecture with a prayer, but it was a short one. Now, if it's not that, what then is the vehicle, uh, if it's not their personal religious commitment, what is it that brought uh, religious thinking to bear on uh, the creation of modern Western economics? And here I look to uh, what we in our country think of as the great figure in the history of ETH, namely Einstein, and I'm going to draw on an concept of Einstein's that I will translate as world view, built der Welt, I suppose, in uh, the original. Uh, Einstein famously uh, claimed that scientific thought is always a development from pre-scientific thought, but he was more explicit in one of his papers called Principles of Research. Uh, he explained that the world is simply too complex to make progress by addressing the world as it is. We cannot do that. We have to have in mind some image of the world, some world view that we analyze instead of the world in all of its complexity or else we'll just never get anywhere. And importantly, Einstein was not referring only to physicists. And in this statement, which I've pulled from his paper of 1930, he mentions poets, he mentions painters, he mentions philosophers. Philosophers is important for our purpose because that's what Smith was. Smith was not an economist. The word economist didn't even exist during Smith's lifetime. Smith was a professor of moral philosophy. And so Einstein's view is that people form a worldview, an image of the world, and that's what they analyze. So what I'm going to be asking is where Smith's worldview came from. Am I on legitimate grounds in thinking that this concept applies to economics? Well, certain of my predecessors at Harvard thought so. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter uh, famously uh, spoke and wrote in terms of what he called pre-analytic vision the vision of the world that you have in mind before you sit down to do uh, any analysis. Uh, that's not a typo on the slide, incidentally. Uh, every time Schumpeter wrote of pre-analytic vision, it was always an uppercase V on the vision. And my dear colleague and friend, uh, Ken Galbraith, whom I miss uh, enormously, as has already been quoted, uh, famously said that ide economic ideas are always an intimately a product of their own time and place. So what then was the great movement in thinking that gave rise to modern Western economics? Uh, 
I'll summarize it briefly in only three questions. Uh, what was economic thinking, to call it economic, although they didn't yet have the word, as of 1700? Question one, uh, could individuals correctly perceive their self-interest? The answer was mostly no, and that's why it was deemed important to run economies on a top-down basis. The French had their mercantilist system, the British had their system of uh, government-granted monopolies. Second, and getting closer to the question of whether there's such thing as the first fundamental welfare theorem, even if people could ferret out what was in their own interest to do, there was no presumption as of 1700 that their acting on that self-interest would make anybody other than, than themselves better off. And for that reason, acting on your own self-interest was deemed to be morally opprobrious. The standard adjective applied was vicious, and the standard noun was a vice. Skip forward to 1790. I pick 1790 simply because that's the year in which Smith died. The answers are very different. Can individuals correctly perceive their self-interest? The answer Smith gave was yes when they act as producers. Smith was a very sharp thinker uh, in both the Moral Sentiments book and the Wealth of Nations. He was scathing about the consumption preferences of most people, especially the rich, but like a clever mathematician who knows not to assume more than anything you really need to prove your theorem, uh, Smith understood that if people get it right when they act as producers, that's sufficient for his purposes. Then from there, Smith did have the first fundamental welfare theorem, acting on our self-interest, under the right circumstances will make other people better off. And of course, Smith's great contribution was to establish that competitive markets uh, was met what made this uh, true. And again, by the time you get to 1790, because of this line of thinking, the whole notion that acting on your self-interest in the economic sphere is opprobrious morally is simply gone. Now, to be clear, Smith did have intellectual precursors, uh, both in France. Uh, France is important. Smith lived in uh, France for about two years uh, when he was just starting to write The Wealth of Nations. Uh, he refers to Cantillon's book, for example, in The Wealth of Nations. He was very close when he lived in Paris. He was very close to Canet. He said that if, he, if Canet had still been living, Canet died in 1773, Wealth of Nations came out three years later. Smith said that if Canet had still been living, he would have dedicated the book to Canet. So he was influenced by these people, and there were other people in England that he wrote about uh, as well. So we have to address frontally the question of whether they deserve the credit. Instead, should people like me think of uh, Pierre Nicole, for example, as the father of our discipline? Should we think of uh, Canet? Maybe. Uh, my answer to that is frontally, no, we should not. And the reason is that even though those people intuited the result, they had no story for why it was true. It's like knowing intuitively that, the, that a theorem is true without being able to prove it. Well, uh, they had, in particular, they had no notion, none of those people had any notion of the role of markets or the competitive mechanism in bringing the result about. And we might say, okay, they didn't have our story, but they didn't have any other story uh, either. And for a generation educated in Newtonian uh, concepts of system and mechanism, that just wasn't going to fly. Uh, Joel mentioned uh, before the influence of Newton, which was profound. Newton's great work, the Principia Mathematica, was published in 1687. By the time Smith was an undergraduate in the 1730s, the book was part of the required curriculum at every Scottish university, also at Cambridge, Interestingly, not at Oxford, and this is probably one reason why for more than a century Oxford lagged behind 
uh, Cambridge and other places in scientific uh, endeavor. Uh, but for this, these were, these were all intellectuals trained as Newtonian. Newtonians, they wanted to know what the system was, they wanted to know what the mechanism was, and so what Pierre Nicole or uh, Bernard Mandeville had to say on the subject just didn't matter. So what is the uh, contribution? Now let's be a little sharper uh, about the contribution in the wealth of nations. First, the desire for material gain is innate in us and therefore no more morally opprobrious than the fact that we eat, we have to eat, we have to breathe. Uh, there's this lovely passage in The Wealth of Nations in which Smith says that our desire to improve our condition comes with us from the womb and stays with us from the, till the grave, and in between there's scarcely a moment where it's not acting on us. And of course, improving our condition could mean lots of things, but he immediately goes on and makes clear that it's about our economic condition. Second, what makes this system work is the role of competitively set wages and prices. And Smith's description makes clear the Newtonian thinking. Uh, here's the passage in which he's describing the way in which markets drive what he called the central price. We would today call it the market clearing equilibrium price, uh, the, the actual price to the market clearing equilibrium price. And if you look at it, look, look at how Newtonian the language is. Talk about the prices gravitating and talk about things being suspended and being forced down, settling, intending. He could be talking about planets. What happens if a planet gets nudged out of its orbit? Well, it settles back into the orbit. Of course, he's not talking about uh, planets. He's talking about market prices. Uh, he thinks of these competitively set market uh, prices and wages as just the product of two-sided bargains in which everybody is simply trying to get his own best advantage. There's no altruism involved. And so he thinks of all of this as an example of the enlightenment principle of unintended and unforeseen consequences. Most importantly of all, as we've already been mentioned, he understands that under these competitive market circumstances, individuals acting on their own self-interest will make other people uh, better off, make them better off as individuals if they're trading with them or hiring them or buying from them, and also make, he's explicit, it makes the society better off as well. And this is, of course, the proposition that we know today as the invisible hand, although it's very ironic that we call it that. Smith used the phrase invisible hand only once in each book only once in The Wealth of Nations and only once in the Moral Sentiments book, and he didn't make a big thing about it. He just did it in, in passing. So it's odd that we, uh, we think of it that way, but we do. That's, the, that's our label. And therefore, of course, we know that Smith was opposed to mark Im, impedimenta to the competitive market mechanism, but, and here is where I think Smith has been very ill-treated, especially by conservatives, either economists or those in the political sphere, what impressed Smith was the astonishing robustness of this mechanism. Smith did not think of the market mechanism as some delicate hothouse flower that had to be protected against all sorts of um, encroachments. Uh, and therefore, Smith was very willing to uh, entertain and support all sorts of interferences with the market mechanism when he thought they were appropriate, most importantly for uh, the purposes of our host. Uh, Smith, understood, Smith understood and supported the monopoly powers of central banks. Thomas and his colleagues have a monopoly over something, and it's important. Smith was for that. He was for tighter regulation over private banks than anything we know, and certainly within my lifetime. Uh, Smith uh, believed in progressive income taxes. Uh, he was very straightforward. It was just so that the poor had a lighter burden uh, than the rich, especially in my country, uh, 
Uh, lots of businessmen, economists too, go around wearing Adam Smith neckties. Uh, usually an Adam Smith necktie is a sign of somebody who's heard of the wealth of nations but never read it and, <laughs> and, and who's never heard of the theory of moral sentiments. Next time you see somebody, especially an American, I want you to do something for me. Next time you see an American wearing an Adam Smith necktie, I want you to go up to the person and say, ah, I see you're in favor of progressive income taxes. And the person will have no idea what you're talking about, but it happens to be true. Smith was in favor of luxury taxes. His example was luxury carriages, and he was straightforward. The proceeds should be used to alleviate poverty he was even in favor of taxes on whiskey and distilleries. That's pretty good for somebody living in Scotland. <laughs> now, what enabled Smith and his uh, predecessors to a limited extent to get to these insights? Well, we've already mentioned Newtonian ideas of system and mechanism. Uh, Smith was very well trained uh, in Stoic philosophy, which is all about his favorites were Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. Stoic philosophy is all about harmony in the uh, universe. And so if you believe in harmony in the universe, it makes sense that if Joel does something that is in his interest, maybe that's going to make me better off and vice versa. So it's consistent. Smith was a very smart man. He knew merchants. He lived in a commercial society in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Paris, London. He watched this. He was an, uh, he was an a philosopher, is based on introspection, but I think there, this is all standard. I think there's something missing, and I think what it was was this enormous transition in religious thinking within the English speaking Protestant world uh, in which he lived. And I have in mind, to be specific, the turn away from predestinarian Calvinism. Now, as uh, anybody who knows a little about theology will be aware, uh, the turn away from predestinarian Calvinism had many elements, many of which have nothing to do with our uh, inquiry at the moment, but there were three that I think are crucial for our purposes, one about human nature, one about human destiny, and one about human purposes, and I'll be very explicit about each one. In terms of uh, human nature, Calvin famously wrote that in humans are, as in his words, totally depraved. Why? Uh, because of the sin of our first parents in the garden. Uh, this is the famous Lucas Cranach um, portrayal of the, uh, of the crucial moment. Incidentally, Cranach was a great friend of Martin Luther. And when Luther left the church and got married, Cranach was the best man at the wedding. But this is, uh, this is uh, the crucial moment. And according to Calvin, because of that moment, we are unable to do uh, any good. We are unable to tell good from evil. And by contrast, the post-Calvinists believed that there is inherent goodness and the ability to see right from wrong within each individual. In Locke's famous phrase, we are each born with the candle of the Lord. That was Locke's phrase. And if we would only use that candle, uh, we would be able to see what's requisite for us to do. Second, in terms of human destiny, uh, Calvin uh, famously believed and taught uh, that who is to be saved and who is not was decided not only before each of us was born, but before the world was even created. And therefore, of course, there's no opportunity whatsoever for any decision we might take, any action we might uh, come to, any choice uh, to be influential in this regard. Uh, this is the famous uh, memling uh, uh, depiction. Uh, and uh, for purposes of our distinguished uh, central bankers, uh, the question is whether uh, people are uh, on the left because they uh, follow the dictates of the central bank. And uh, Memling had a view on the right of what happens when people do not uh, 
follow what the central bank is, uh, is, is urging them to do, but it applies at the, uh, according to Calvin, at the individual level as well. And by contrast, the post-Calvinists believe not only that everybody is potentially able to be saved, but that our individual choices and actions matter. As John Tillotson put it, Tillotson was the first Archbishop of Canterbury, appointed after the English Revolution in 1688. It's up to us to cooperate with the divine in achieving our own salvation. And then finally, in terms of why we're all here in the first place, uh, the Calvin view was that the sole reason we are here is the glorification of God. One of the fam most famous of Calvin's phrases is that the entire earth is a theater of God's glory. And by contrast, the post-Calvinists believed that we are uh, here because we are intended by the divine to be happy. Now, not only do these, does this more benign, optimistic view of the possibilities of the human character, but the more expansive view of the possibilities of human agency resonate with the idea that I acting on my own interest can make you better off. It turns out that this debate was at its height in Scotland exactly when Smith and Hume were coming to young adulthood and therefore forming what Einstein would have called their worldview or what my predecessor Schumpeter would have called their pre-analytic vision. This was a rolling phenomenon. It was at its height in England in the latter half of the 17th century. It was at its height in Scotland in the middle of the 18th century. Smith was born in 1723, and uh, it was at its height in my country uh, in the latter half of the 18th century, which incidentally is not irrelevant to the creation of the American Republic, but that's a conversation for a different day. Now, given that Smith and Hume and their colleagues were mostly non-religious men, why would this uh, religious uh, on debate going on around them have had an influence on their worldview or vision. I want to introduce three reasons very quickly before I'm through. One is simply that they lived in a world in which religion was more central, more pervasive, more multidimensional than anything we know in modern Western uh, society. All educational institutions then were religiously based. Everybody assumed, for example, that he, everybody knew that Hume was the leading light of the Scottish Enlightenment, but he could never get a university appointment. Uh, Hume put himself forward twice for professorships in Scottish universities. He was turned down both times because of his uh, religious view. Uh, the Scots had voted themselves out of being an independent country in 1707 with the Act of Union, so they had no more independent royal court, they had no more parliament, all of that patronage was gone. What did they have for patronage? They had a church. So uh, religion was multidimensional and important. Also, intellectual life was integrated then in a way that it isn't uh, now. It was true in university life. It was true uh, elsewhere. Uh, Smith was a professor at the University of Glasgow. It was a pretty small place. There were only 14 professors at Glasgow. Here's a list, as they would have put it, of the entire faculty of the University of Glasgow. Smith was the professor of moral philosophy. Right there on his faculty was a professor of divinity, as they called it, we would call it theology today, and a professor of church history. And unlike the way it is at my, my university has a divinity school, that's a separate faculty. I don't have theologians on, uh, on my faculty. And they were all housed together. This is what the University of Glasgow looked like. Other than the chapel in the front yard, they were all in the same building. At my university, we segregate the theologians into a divinity school that's about a half a mile away. 
Uh, at the Yale Divinity School, the, 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 the Yale Divinity School is more than, not only more than a mile away, it's up a very steep hill. And so if you're going, if you're going on a bicycle, you have to really want to get there. Uh, that's not the case uh, when Smith was at Glasgow. Uh, Edinburgh and uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow were famous for their uh, intellectual dining societies. Who did these people talk to? Well, the most distinguished was called the Select uh, Society. Uh, Smith and Hume were both among the original 32 members. Here are the 32 members of the uh, uh, Select Society at the beginning. Smith and Hume were both, uh, both members. Five of the 32 were Church of Scotland uh, ministers, including their great friend uh, Robertson, who was the head of the church. And Robertson himself was exemplary of the integration. Robertson was simultaneously the head of the Church of Scotland and the principal in today's vocabulary, the president of the uh, University of Edinburgh. It would be as if the president of my university were simultaneously the president of Harvard and the head of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. Well, he isn't, um, or, as if, or as if his predecessor had been the president of Harvard and the presiding bishop over the Episcopal Church of the United States. Well, she wasn't, but Robertson uh, was. And then finally, I think, and this is one of the reasons I was emphasizing the storming of the monastery and the execution of the heretics and the um, First and Second Capel Wars here in the Swiss Confederacy. These debates at that time were contentious in a way that we have no idea of today. Uh, on the continent, the Thirty Years' War between the Catholics and the Protestants was more deadly in terms of Europe, compared to Europeans, Europe's population than either World War I or World War II. <clears throat> the English uh, Civil War fought within the grandparents, the time of the grandparents of Smith and Hume were, uh, was the same. There was ongoing resistance to royal authority on religious grounds. The Highland Rebellion in Scotland uh, took place when Smith was 22 years old. We think of the Highland Rebellion as this romantic thing that we read about in Walter Scott novels. Uh, it was a pretty deadly exercise. This is a uh, picture of the uh, English troops under Cumberland slaughtering the unarmed uh, Scottish uh, Highlanders. Uh, part of this took place right outside of Edinburgh when Smith was 25 years old. So mo these people could not have helped but pay attention, and as I've emphasized already, most important, uh, there was a s this substantive coherence between the new economic thinking, which is all about uh, my ability to make you better off and vice versa by our acting only on our own innate uh, self-interest and this new religious thinking which gave us a more optimistic view of the human character and a more expansive view of the possibilities of human agency. My argument is that these religious ideas were part of the Einsteinian worldview, the Schumpeterian <coughs> vision <coughs> that Smith and Hume acquired from what was going on around them. And I think this gave uh, them, in effect, what they were doing was secularizing the religious thinking of their day. And that's what gave us modern Western economics, along with <clears throat> the moral legitimacy of capitalism. Now, let me take a moment to anticipate one question that is sure to be on people's minds. What's the relation of all this to Weber? Because if I didn't mention it, somebody else surely uh, would. How does this connect to Weber? Well, there are both uh, similarities and differences. The two strongest parallels are first, the idea that religious thinking has implications for secular uh, thinking. That was Weber's great argument. I accept it. 
And second, importantly, Weber showed how the impact of religious thinking on secular uh, action and thinking can survive the passing of the original uh, religious impulse. In effect, he didn't use the word, but in effect, I mean, remember, Weber lived at the time when the leading economic, uh, leading academic discipline was chemistry. And in effect, Weber thought of religious thinking as a catalyst. Make something happen, the catalyst then goes away, but the result of the catalytic action is still there. So the consequences get secularized and eventually people don't even think about them. And that's why Weber used as his ideal type Remember, Weber was a sociologist. He thought in terms of ideal types. His ideal type was Benjamin Franklin. If he had wanted to have an ideal type who was, was a theologian, he would have picked Jonathan Edwards, but he didn't. He picked Franklin. But there are important differences, and most obviously for Weber, the driving impulse was belief in predestinary and Calvinism, and my argument about the thought process of Hume and Smith was the, the origin is the movement away from belief in predestinary and Calvinism. Now, does this mean that Weber was wrong? I would say no, because there are two further differences. One is the time period. Weber, you recall, was all about the 17th century. Smith and Hume were in the 18th century. In the period Weber was looking at, people did believe in predestination. He talks about all these Puritans in New England walking around suffering from what he called existential anxiety over whether they were saved or not. That was pretty well gone in Smith's uh, time. And also there's a difference of what in economics is being influenced. Uh, Weber was all about the economic behavior of ordinary individuals, I'm about the ideas, the thinking of the intellectual elites. Importantly though, as in Weber, this religiously motivated thinking survived Smith and Hume, and I think it's still with us today. It's resonated through Western economics ever since. Here are a bunch of examples of places in which I uh, argue uh, in the book I've written that although each of these debates is about economics, the religious thinking is at work. And it's, if you read carefully what people say, even the economists, it's clear that the religious thinking uh, was at work. And I think it continues to characterize modern Western economics today. Economics is still about human choices and action. You look at, oh, open any introductory economics textbook. What is it about at the beginning? The first half is about the choices made by individuals and firms. The first fundamental welfare theorem is still the heart of our analytical apparatus. The more optimistic view of Smith and Hume is still with us. Uh, economists are very reluctant to recognize limits on anything. When economists write about uh, the greenhouse gas problem, we don't agonize that growth is going to end. We talk about what to do about this problem. That's why most economists are for a carbon tax. And of course, we still have a capitalist economic system. So to conclude, yes, of course, economics was and still is a product of the Enlightenment, and that's important. But this does not mean that the influences that gave rise to modern Western economics did not include religion. I think the role of religious thinking was and continues to be important right at the heart of our discipline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ben, for really this fascinating uh, lecture. Very brilliant and also, I think, challenging intellectually.
And so I, personally, I've learned a lot. I think it's very interesting. And now I think we have uh, the chance to open to the audience for questions. But I have to say, you can use your microphone, but you have to push the button. And when it's red, then you can speak. So before everybody learns exactly how to use the microphone, let me just ask you, Ben, one first question. That was really fascinating how you describe that uh, Scotland at that time was really the place where all these ideas could develop, the, 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 like the influence of the modern thinking on religions than on economics. In your view, if Adam Smith were born elsewhere, what, what would have happened? Was the environment enough rich and stimulating that somebody else would have written uh, the wealth of nation ah. in, in Scotland? Or if uh, Adam Smith stayed in France, he would have written exactly the same book there? That's a very challenging question, and it has the, 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 this, this is like the Tolstoy argument that uh, if, Nap if Napoleon had not come along, with the, with, would uh, all of the events in War and Peace have, 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 have been different? I would like to think that somebody of that worldview would have come up with something close to this. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, Smith uh, had been run over by a bus while walking out of uh, his lecture at uh, Edinburgh. Smith was not the only thinker. Uh, we look to Smith because he wrote the great book, but I've been at great pains to emphasize Hume. Hume incidentally, Hume was Smith's mentor. Uh, the view, which I think is right, is that Hume put him up to it. Hume believed that we should have a science of man comparable to what uh, Newton had done for the physical world. And there was a sense, uh, like having a graduate student and assigning him a problem. Uh, in effect, uh, Hume gave uh, Smith this assignment, and I would like to think that uh, if has Smith uh, had gotten run over by a bus, uh, Hume would have glommed on to Ferguson or mm. uh, Blair or one of the one of these other people. So I would I would like to believe that it would that it would have happened, but you know the Tolstoy argument is still with us. So mm -hmm. uh, people might have different views. Very good. I think we have already there. Okay. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Oh, great to see you. Um, on one slide, you mentioned education as one of the uh, uh, key factors. Now, there are these studies by my colleagues Sasha Becker and uh, Ludger Wassmann who argue that um, in their analysis, was Weber right or wrong? They compared different counties in Germany, and uh, their key argument was that uh, what was kind of decisive for Crows in uh, the counties was not whether it was uh, Protestant or Catholic, but whether um, uh, the uh, uh, were educated well and trained well, and Luther pushed to learn the Bible, and this was kind of the key mechanism for Crows. Uh, um, what do you think about this argument? I don't have a view as as you're. I mean, you're perfectly right there. There is, that's why we call it the Weber hypothesis, because uh, we don't take it as necessarily right, and there's this enormous uh, debate over whether, whether Weber got the empirics right, uh, given that he was a sociologist and not an economist. I, I'm sympathetic to the notion that he might not have done the empirics as, as uh, carefully as an economist uh, w would have. Um, but... So I don't, want to, I don't want to take a view about whether Weber was right. I am certainly sympathetic to the notion that whether people were literate or not had an enormous amount to do with the development of capitalism on the ground uh, as it had to do with other things. Th think of just the Protestant Reformation itself, the fact that Germany in the 1520s and 30s or at least uh, Luther's part of Germany had uh, had a uh, the, the fact that had such a high literacy rate uh, 
in that day had a lot to do with Luther's uh, success. So, you know, you read about Luther was a real production uh, genius. He was sitting there just churning out these endless uh, pamphlets, and the pamphlets would be rushed off to the printer, and within 20, uh, within uh, 24 hours, there would be 15,000 copies in circulation. That was a lot in those days. One of the, one of the questions I sometimes ask my students uh, is, why is it that Luther succeeded and Jan Hus failed? Well, the answer is Gutenberg. No, uh, Luther had this dissemination mechanism that Hus didn't have. So I agree that uh, literacy is extremely uh, important. Now, as I mentioned in my remarks on Weber, um, I'm interested here in the intellectual history, and so I'm looking at the intellectual elites, the people who wrote down their ideas. And of course, these people were all living in a highly literate uh, world. Scottish Enlightenment, they wrote down what they thought, they commented on, e on each other's work. So was literacy important? You bet it was. Mm -hmm. I have already a big list of people who would like to ask questions. So I have, I think, Pierre, is that? Or, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, Benoit Mojon from the, the BIS. Uh, I'd like to uh, first uh, thank you, a fantastic lecture, it was uh, amazing. Uh, but uh, also ask you about um, one claim of a Swiss economic historian, Paul Berock, uh, who claimed uh, in his uh, history of the Industrial Revolution that uh, Adam Smith uh, did not see it. Um, so I'm sorry, that Adam Smith what? Did not see, uh, what was not uh, realizing that uh, the Industrial Revolution oh, yes. was happening, even though, you know, I mean, Lancashire was not very far from, uh, from, from Scotland. Um, so uh, given the, that uh, economic ideas as a product of their time, uh, what do you think of this claim of uh, Paul Berog that uh, um, Adam Smith did not realize uh, the transformation that was uh, starting in England? Um, uh, a few years before he wrote uh, The Wealth of Nations. I think he's absolutely correct. I think the evidence is clear that even though Smith was living at the outset of the Industrial Revolution, he didn't, he didn't see it. He, he just didn't see it. And I think the strongest evidence <clears throat> is that Smith did not understand the role of ongoing technical progress. You remember, what's the very first paragraph of the Wealth of Nations book? Smith asserts that the greatest increases in productivity come from increasing division of labor, specialization in production. And of course, this leads him into all sorts of odd places because he understands, and later in the book writes about, the deleterious effects on the individuals of ever-increasing uh, demand for labor. But nobody at that time yet understood the Im implications of ongoing. And, and the further demonstration that what you say is exactly correct is remember Smith's great uh, in, uh, example of uh, productivity increase was the pin factory. Uh, I hope everybody know, everybody's heard, I hope everybody knows that pin is the 18th century word for a, a nail a house nail. Smith was not writing about safety pins or women's hat pins or something like that. He's writing about house nails. And so his, his, the example he gives famously is a pin factory, not anything to do with textiles. If he had understood the Industrial Revolution, surely the example would have been some kind of a textile factory. But Smith was not alone. And um, the earliest example I know of somebody who was explicit about the role in economics of ongoing technical progress is the American Francis Wayland in the 1830s, specifically 18, his 1837 textbook. And I've argued that it's not coincidental that it happened not till the 1830s, and it wasn't coincidental that it happened in America. But Smith was 60 years, Wealth of Nations is 60 years before Wayland. So I absolutely agree. Thank you. I think I have a gentleman over there, please. Um, I think it is quite interesting to note that economic theory in general comes from a very 
from a very limited number of places. So you mentioned Scotland and maybe France and Germany and the United States. Even though the matter that you discuss as economist is not very really limited to those places. And in my own subject, which does not happen to be econo economics, but chemistry, chemistry has been practiced, at least if you count alchemy, basically everywhere since the beginning of time, I guess, and has also been practiced in India and in China and so on. And I would be curious if you were, if you would agree to extend your argument even insofar as to say that the ideas of, of post-Calvinism are sort of a precondition for the ideas of economic theory to arise. And maybe that explains at least partially why that has not happened in other non-Western places as much as it has. Well, I think you're raising a really interesting question and I would love, I don't have the knowledge base to tackle that question, but I would love for some graduate students to show up and, uh, you know, uh, you're, and, and this is, your question is precisely why I tried to be very careful, both in the book and one of my remarks, always to talk about modern Western economics. I'm very aware that there are lines of thinking about economics that are not modern and not Western. So what I was interested in is where modern Western economics comes from, what people like me teach in economics departments in my country and uh, in Europe, but you are absolutely right. People have been thinking about economic issues in one way or another since, uh, presumably, since recorded history. And um, there's a lot of uh, economics in the Hebrew Bible. There's a lot of ec interesting economics uh, in the Muslim world, enormous amount of thinking about economics in the scholastic period, uh, um, who... Um, protege of, uh, of, uh, of Weber, um, well, I'm not coming up with the name. There's a great book on uh, the influence of Tokugawa uh, religion in Japan on all of these samurai uh, uh, families. So I, I would love for somebody other than me to investigate uh, uh, other kinds <laughs> of, of economics and where they come from and what the religious influence was. I don't have the knowledge base to do it. I'll, I'll, I'll finish with just one example that I think is going to be very interesting. As everybody knows, the Chinese, as we speak, are evolving their own form of capitalism. It is capitalism, it's not communism, but it's not our form of capitalism. And the world is gonna see an experiment over time of how well that does. Uh, compared to us once they are at the frontier of uh, technological progress. Uh, it would be really interesting for somebody who knows about uh, traditional uh, Chinese uh, religion to write a book about the extent to which Chinese, the Chinese version of capitalism today is or is not in part a product of the Chinese uh, religion in the way that ours is a product of ours. I'm not gonna write that book, not because I'm not interested, I just don't know enough, but there must be somebody coming along who will know and can do it, and I, and I hope somebody does it. Ben, I still have a list here and hope that we get short questions. And, and short answers, Short yeah. answers, so I think the lady over there is next. I got, I got it, I got okay. it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Isabel Martinez. I work here at ETH. I'm an economist. Um, so thank you very much for this lecture. I, I learned a lot. Um, I have very little knowledge about the history of religion. My impression, though, was, that, or my question is, yes, I understand why religion would influence the, th the history of economic thought and the way you describe, but why, where did these changes in the way religious or the changes in religion and in, in religious thought, these changes didn't fall from heaven either. So doesn't it in the end all go back to enlightenment? Uh, there is an excellent book with the same title as mine, not uh, coincidentally, uh, by Richard Tawney. Uh, Tawney uh, was a uh, socialist, probably Marxist, uh, 
intellectual historian of the 19 teens and 1920s who made exactly the argument that you're making. Uh, Tawney argued that it was the economic developments on the ground that gave rise to the religious thinking. Tawney was replying to Weber, so the key element of religious uh, thinking was the predestination. And Tawney argued that it was what was happening uh, in the economy of Geneva that drove uh, the rise of uh, uh, predestinarian thinking rather than the other way around. Um, I have not myself worked on that, but I would say that as an economist, I'm very comfortable with the notion of two-way causation. Economists just in general are comfortable with two-way causation in ways that people in other disciplines tend not to be. And so what I've chosen to write is a book on the way in which religious thinking was important for economic thinking. But could it be, a la Tony, that the economics or the economic thinking was important for the religious thinking? Well, it could well be, and if so, to me that simply makes the whole thing much more interesting because then you get the prospect of a, of a, uh, of, of a feedback loop. I understand that, I, I talk to a lot of people in other disciplines, I understand that people in other disciplines are uncomfortable with two-way causation. They want to know which way it goes. But economists generically are quite comfortable with that. I think I have a gentleman over here. Yeah. Who was good? Okay. Please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Antonis Lietegner, University of Luzerne. Um, my question goes back to uh, the central parts of your argument, and I would like to know. Um, why these two persons, which were central in, Scot in Scotland, Hume and Smith, they kept the anthropology of uh, the Calvinist thinking and they dropped um, the theological part. You talked about Hume as maybe atheist and uh, Smith never talking about religion. So this is the first question is, why happened it to these two individuals? And the second question is, uh, does, it, does it have an impact on um, the emergent uh, thinking, Western modern thinking about capitalism? So is it important that they are not pious? Well, uh, I rather like the way you put it. I hadn't thought it to put it that way in terms of keeping the anthropology and dropping the theology. I had, uh, uh, but I rather like that. And I think, again, to me, it's a matter of the world view. How do I think of people in the world? And the idea is that if, uh, if, if I live in a society in which everybody around me thinks that the most important aspect of a person's existence is predetermined before the person is even born, then I'm unlikely to think that the person can by his or her own, own actions, influence other things as well. It sort of spills over. And similarly, if I uh, live in a world in which everybody thinks that human character is totally depraved, I don't think of that as spilling over to the idea that acting on my own wicket, I'm likely to end up making you, uh, w making you better off. Now, uh, I don't... I guess the best I can do in answering your question is to emphasize again that I don't think any of this was a matter of self-conscious thought. It's this notion of the world view, the vision. It's, this is all what's in the world around them. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, later time, but same idea, had the notion of what are the ideas and concepts that are in the air we breathe. I think that's what it's about and if that uh, if you would like to articulate that as, as accepting the, the anthropology, well, I, I think that's fine. But I think that's the best I can do on that. I still have three questions, and I think then we have to uh, close the round here. I think the gentleman over there, you wanted to ask a question. Thank you very much for such a 
gracious uh, lecture, so a gracious way of captivating uh, the attention of the audience. Uh, I'm Christoph Uhlinger, I'm a historian of religion uh, at the university here. And I would like to join actually the question which has been raised before by uh, this lady over there, the student. Uh, if I understand the, your main argument, there is something like religion first, and then it gets secularized in economic theory. And uh, I wonder whether this is the only way and the best way of thinking about the historical processes and with your comment on double causation or double direction causation, I think uh, you have given a, an even better clue uh, both to understand the Reformation uh, and to understand what uh, happened later. So since you already asked the question and you gave us such a great answer, I think the answer was very important to uh, go even further than what your first uh, uh, what your what your first uh, lecture gave. So thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm my question was where did our modern Western economics come from? So to put it in economic terms, uh, you can run a regression either way, and because of what I wanted to explain. I put the economic thinking on the left, okay? But you could easily run the same regression with the economic thinking on the right. And of course, if you don't have anything else to achieve identification, then it's just uh, the same thing. But part of what the whole construction of the argument... Incidentally, the, sa the same issue arose in my Moral Consequences of Growth uh, book. Is it that societies are more tolerant and more... Uh, fair and more generous and more democratic because they're experiencing economic growth or is it that uh, they are more fair and tolerant and democratic and therefore they grow? Well, my answer is that it's both, but and I address that in that book, but I chose to run the regression. That book runs the regression in that way because I, as Thomas put it correctly, I wanted to answer the question, why should all of us who live in rich societies think growth is an objective? No, but I'm very comfortable <laughs> with mutual causation. Very good. Now I have the young gentleman over there, and then we finish with uh, Professor Eichenberger, and then we come to a close of the uh, lecture. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Peter, and I'm also from um, America, so... Um, I was wondering, actually, having grown up in Kentucky, um, kind of in the, around the Bible Belt, um, and then having gone to Harvard, um, maybe, you know, universities were considered a little more liberal, how do you think that that has shaped your, your um, kind of perception and the way that you've um, approached this topic, and especially the way you've written your books, and maybe, like, how your biases, biases if I could put it like that, um, how, how has that shaped the way you've kind of approached this? It's a very interesting uh, question. Um, I am not aware of any specific uh, influence on my intellectual uh, trajectory from having grown up where I did, but you make a perfectly valid point. All around me as I was growing up, now I didn't live in the heart of the Bible uh, belt, uh, but I certainly knew people uh, as a child, just right through uh, up until the time when at age 18 I went off to Harvard. Uh, I certainly knew people whom you would describe as Bible Belt people, and maybe at some subterranean uh, level uh, that was influential in my thinking. Um, but it would not, uh, it would, it would not be, uh, it would not be surprising. Uh, as people may be aware, um, compared to Europe, America is an astonishingly uh, religion-oriented society even today, and the particular piece of uh, America where I grew up uh, is more so than uh, the average, which is your point, which is is correct. So maybe 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 that was uh, maybe that was in influential, and if so, so be it. <laughs> Very good. And Rainer, please. 
um, Ryan Reichenberg from University of Fribourg. So I wonder whether one could not turn your question up on its head. So you ask why did Smith not invent, but why was it the first to write about market in this way? But I think one could also ask why did all the others not see the point? Because well, the point, sorry, why did wh why did all the others not see the important point? Because it is so obvious. And I guess all the merchants in the Middle Age and all, all already the Romans knew the point. So they knew, all the merchants know, knew, they are not there for, yeah, for being good people, but for their own interest, they go to the market. And they knew they have to give good products to the consumers, otherwise they cannot sell it. And they all knew that competition forces them to produce better goods and better services. And all the consumer knew it's better to have competition among the producers. Therefore, they all went to the fairs, and therefore all the fairs and markets developed in Europe. And it was so important to have these fairs and markets, because everybody knew in competition is important. Mm. And so for me, the fascinating thing is, why did only Smith see this important point? And why all the other intellectuals did not see what everybody else knew? <clears throat> well, I have, uh, I'll answer your question in two ways. <clears throat> uh, I, first, first of all, I agree. It's interesting that they missed it. Uh, and, and, but they missed it in a particular sense. Uh, they, again, all of these people that I listed, uh, say in, in France, I think the person who got it, who came closest was Pierre Nicole. Uh, Nicole was writing in the 1670s and 1680s. Um, he absolutely got the first welfare theorem right. He understood the result. He articulated it extremely uh, well. His uh, great essay is called of, uh, uh, Self-Love and Charity. Self-love is the theological word for following your self-interest. And he says that uh, self-love knows how to dress itself up so that even in a world where there is no charity whatsoever, the outcomes are the same as if everybody were driven by charity. So he's got the result. He states the outcome of the theorem. But there's no story, none, none whatsoever. Just quite astonishing. You, you say, why didn't he get it? Well, uh, well, he didn't. Uh, or, so, or, simple, or similarly, Mandeville. Mandeville's a great example. Mandeville has all these uh, wonderful examples uh, uh, in uh, the fable of the bees. Uh, and even the subtitle of the Mandeville uh, fable of the bees is private vices, public benefits. And what he means by private vices is not who's smoking at, uh, uh, opium and who's cheating on his wife. Private vices is no more than acting on your self-interest. So right there, he's, <laughs> he's stating for you the first welfare theorem right in the subtitle of, of the work. You read it and there's nothing, nothing at all in there about competition. And so uh, that's why I think that we really do have to give the credit to Smith. Now, where did he get it? Um, again, he lived in this commercial society in these various cities. He knew uh, new merchants. Uh, so there are many, many uh, reasons. And again, I, I place a lot of emphasis, but this is in no way original to me, I place a lot of emphasis on the Newtonian thinking. He, at Hume's behest, wanted to have a system. He wanted to know what the mechanism was. And um, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe um, Mandeville just was not sufficiently Newtonian. Maybe, maybe it was too early. Uh, maybe, maybe men Maybe Mandeville had never read Newton, I don't know, but, but Smith, cer Smith certainly had. He'd read it in college. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. I raised my hand, but I didn't see you. Okay, I didn't see you. Okay, I make an exception, but then we have to close here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, my question is uh, regarding, so 
I think we have like two big problems at the moment, like inequality and environmental problems. And I would argue that they are caused um, a lot by capitalism as well. And I want to take up the three ideas that you brought, which was that we believe now that there is like a good candle in a human, that we believe um, that we can like create the way where we are going and that we are striving for happiness um, other than appreciation of the bigger good. Um, and so do we have to wait uh, until these beliefs do change again, until we can solve these problems maybe? Uh, y yes, um, I mean this is a, this is again a classic Smithian <clears throat> uh, problem. Uh, the environmental uh, issue is a, is a, is an externality. We all understand what externalities are, and Smith understood what externalities are. Uh, Smith didn't have the vocabulary of market failure and externality the way we do, but he certainly had the concept. There's uh, when Smith is advocating. He's writing in the uh, aftermath of the Scottish banking crisis of 1772, and he's uh, advocating all of these restrictions on banks' ability to fund themselves and also on the asset side of the balance sheet, their ability to make loans. And he, he gives the explanation. He says, I favor these restrictions for the same reason that I favor the laws requiring firewalls between the row houses in Edinburgh. No, it, it, it's a straightforward externality. He, he's got the concept. Now, what do we do about the externality having to do with the greenhouse gas emissions and all of that uh, sort of thing? Well, we need some kind of intervention. Uh, most economists are in favor of a carbon tax. I certainly am, but I'm certainly uh, in favor of various regulatory devices uh, as well. There is a problem here that is a political economy problem, not an economics problem. A fundamental principle of political economy is that we want to deal with externalities at the level at which they apply. So, for example, if the problem we're deal if the externality we're dealing with is that if I drop litter, I drop my coffee cup on the street here in uh, Zurich, that's a local Zurich problem, and <clears throat> the city of Zurich is perfectly capable of dealing with that on its own. Some problems are bigger than that. So, I live in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is downwind from a lot of industry in Ohio and western Pennsylvania, think Pittsburgh. So we in Massachusetts even uh, can't solve that problem. We have to do this by a regional level. Well, now we get to greenhouse gas emissions, and as the name of global or climate change implies, the externality applies at the global level, and the reason this is so challenging is that, as we all know, uh, the world is not structured in a way to give a strong global government. So what we're grappling with is how do we attack a global externality in a world of very weak global government governance uh, uh, mechanisms? Well, we're groping our way toward it. There's the Kyoto thing. There's the Paris Accords. Some of these uh, international agreements work pretty well. I think the law of the sea works well. The one on endangered species works sort of well. Uh, so I wouldn't despair, but I think the principle involved is a straightforward economic principle at the level of needing to, needing to have some intervention to deal with the externality. It's the political economy that's very difficult. Well, Ben, we could go on for hours. I think there are so many questions and I have to apologize to everybody who I didn't uh, uh, figure out that they uh, were asking a question. But Ben, we are coming to a close to this uh, Karl Brunner Distinguished Lecture. We would like to thank you really for this brilliant lecture, also a very demanding lecture. As you saw all these uh, very difficult and important questions. So thank you so much for this uh, lecture and that you came to Zurich. And I would like to thank everybody for joining us uh, tonight. It was really good to see you all again after a couple of years where we had either no Karl Brunner lecture 
or only in a virtual, on a virtual basis. Let me already say today, the next Carla Brunner lecture, and I have to look at it very carefully, it's also Thursday, but the 21 of September 2023, and you are all, of course, welcome and invited already today. So we wish you a very good evening. Thank you very much for joining us, and give us, again, a big round of applause for Ben's lecture. Thank you.